I just wanted to check with uh, all of you. Uh, I, I recognize some faces here. How many of you are actually caregivers of someone with uh, frontotemporal dementia or a, a disorder like it? Okay. Um, this is a, a, a lunar eclipse. Uh, it's uh, last night's lunar eclipse. You might wonder how come I have that. That's because my son was up at 3.30 and my shift was from 4.30 to 5.30. Uh, <laughs> so we both watched that together last night. Um, I'm having some issues already with this. There we go. So I, I will be talking about frontotemporal dementias. Um, the reason why Susan was confused about whether Dr. Banks was giving was speaking or not is that her name also appears on the uh, on the title slide. Uh, she uh, is uh, she could be just as well be the co-director of the uh, Young Onset Dementia Clinic, but she has so many other things to do that uh, she's left that to me. But uh, we're a team, uh, and the, the the this particular clinic wouldn't function without her. This talk is actually a mixture of talks that her and I have both given, and so um, her name belongs uh, on the, the title slide. Let me start with a, a short movie. Is the sound going to work for the movie? Should? There we go. So, so this is a movie, um, it's actually a, a, a fairly long movie, and that's just a section of it that was put together by the UCSF um, Memory and Aging Center. Uh, it's about frontotemporal dementia. This particular patient has frontotemporal dementia. This particular patient does not have any problems with memory. He's correct in saying my memory is not as good as it used to be, but my memory is fine. Uh, what's not fine is his general behavior, and you could appreciate that immediately by seeing the kind of activities that he partakes in, including finding um, frappuccinos in garbage cans and then consuming them. Um, he doesn't particularly understand why that's appropriate or not appropriate. Now, um, I've given talks to doctors, I've given talks to students, I've given talks to uh, uh, caregivers before. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different, something that I've never done before, and that is, uh, as a physician, you, you may know that physicians talk about you, we talk about your, the caregivers, we talk about the patients, and it's often a very good way for us to get a sense of what, what's going on, what the patient problems are. Um, we, call, we can call these things case vignettes if you want. What I'd like to do is to present you a case a case of a patient who suffered from frontotemporal dementia. This might be a little, I don't know if you've been in a position where you've, you've, you've had a doctor talking about um, uh, other patients. It might make you a little bit uncomfortable. This is the first time I do this, so uh, I'd appreciate some feedback if, if in any way you felt uncomfortable or, or, if you fe or on the contrary, if you felt it was uh, enlightening. Um, so the talk today will be uh, what is FTD? Um, we'll be talking about the different subtypes of FTD, the behavioral subtype, and you saw an example of that just now. We'll be talking about the language variants in, um, in very, uh, very quickly. And I'll make a few comments about the movement disorders that are sometimes associated with frontotemporal dementia. We'll talk about what causes it, how we diagnose it precisely, how it's treated, and what the future look like, looks like in terms of treatments. Um, and also what we're trying to do about FTD here in, in our clinics. So here's our, my, my case. Now this is the case, this is actually a published case. It's available for, uh, for people to read. Uh, it was published on a, a website uh, that's available to doctors called Medlink. And the particular case was published by Dr. Notman, who is a neurologist in, um, in, in Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and I, I like this case because there's a few videos that go with it, and it's very uh, exemplary of the problems, some of the problems that we deal with. So the case is the case of a 46-year-old man who's a university professor, so very well educated. He runs his lab, he has students, he gets grants. His father recently passed away, and the family thinks he's depressed. Why? 
because he's socially withdrawn, he's irritable and intolerant towards other people, he's not as productive at work as he used to be, and he's also less empathetic towards his students. His adolescent son got a new pair of glasses and he says to him, you look more loser than usual. <laughs> About two students in his class, he calls them Mutt and Jeff because of their appearance. I don't know if you know who Mutt and Jeff is, but it's not a compliment. <laughs> uh, his colleagues say of him that he's no, long, he no longer publishing, he's missing grant deadlines, and he has seven months of unopened mail on his desk. So uh, depression he's seen in psychiatry. Uh, he's given a, a diagnosis of depression, but it's atypical. It's not the typical type of depression that we know responds well to antidepressants. But he's prescribed antidepressants nonetheless. And he, um, two weeks later, uh, he's lighting small fires in his lab. Uh, so this time, it's not his family that brings him to the hospital. It's his boss, because he's lighting fires in his lab. Um, he's uh, seen in psychiatry. Uh, they treat him with a number of medications. Uh, if you think about somebody who's lighting fires, maybe a little bit more active, a little more agitated than they should be. So that he's, there, he's, been giving me he's being given medications to calm him down, including valproic acid and lithium. And he's also given neuroleptics, uh, antipsychotics, medications like Seroquel. This does not help the, the, the patient at all. While he's hospitalized, they notice that he, they notice new behavioral changes. He's whistling to women physicians. He's constantly moving, always agitated. If you ask him what's wrong, he'll say, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm actually having fun. If we examine him, if we sit down and we do a, a, a mini mental status examination, which is a, a test that's scored out of 30, he scores perfect. He doesn't have any memory problems. He doesn't have any writing problems. He doesn't have any drawing problems. But when you sit down and you chat with him, you realize that he's not focusing on the important things of the discussion, that he's tangential, he tends to wander off, and he tends to move a lot. Um, the tests that we do in clinic, the mini mental status examination, very simple test. Uh, frequently we send patients for more extensive uh, memory testing that's called neuropsychological evaluation. It's um, an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes three, four hours. On this particular testing, he does average. Now for a university professor uh, at 47, 48 years of age, average is not average. It means he's probably doing much less well than he should be. Now here he is being, uh, being asked to, uh, to perform a very simple task. How many quarters in six dollars and seventy-five So you can see right away that first of all he's very good at math. Uh, he has no problems to making that calculation. As many of you might have tried it in your head and said, wait a minute. Um, but what's striking here is one, his laughter. Uh, his apparent sort of lack of concern for what's going on. I don't know if you see the pattern of the, on the wall behind him. Um, he's in a nursery. Um, and uh, he he's kind of moves and, and giggles in an inappropriate way given the circumstance. So he doesn't get it. He doesn't really understand. He's seen by neurology. Uh, his neurological examination, examination is normal. Normal tests that we tend to do, and at the time that this particular case uh, took place, he had a CT scan, which was normal. He had an EEG, which was normal. And so they didn't really have a clear diagnosis. Um, the psychiatrist stayed on board and decided that, well, we were going to call this a bipolar disorder, in part because he has this kind of agitation. Um, he was given mood stabilizers, that's the lithium and the valproic acid that I mentioned earlier, and neuroleptics. Doesn't help him. Um, but as time goes on, uh, more problems are noted. Uh, his wife noted, notes that he talks less and he tends to be less able to express himself. He has more difficulties understanding abstraction, sort of nuances in day-to-day in, in, um, in, in -day life. For instance, one of the abstraction tests that we use, uh, how, are, um, how are a train and a bicycle similar? 
how are a train and a bicycle similar? Well, the right answer is, well, they're both modes of transportation. So he wouldn't be able to come up with that. He also has trouble with attention and concentration. And then they're even noticing more behavioral deficits now. He tends to be perseverative and compulsive in some of his actions. He is constantly reciting the alphabet, um, and he, when, particularly when he reads signs. This is his wife, who tells us a little bit about the things that, that, that are going he on. He continuously recites the alphabet, and it doesn't really have any relationship to anything he sees anymore. It used to be something he would pick up as we would drive, road signs, street signs, etc., bulletin boards. But now he, um, he gets stuck on things. If he sees three W's, he'll say, no, I saw three W's, and then he would draw on his fingers, W, 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 W. So as you can see, this is not a university professor anymore. Um, so he's transferred to long-term care, his little kids that he's unable to take care of, and his wife has a job. Um, and we find out that about three years later, he's passed from an aspiration pneumonia. Now, his ultimate diagnosis at the time was difficult to know, but he probably suffered from a combination of FTD and motor neuron disease, or ALS. Uh, which is the kind that leads to a faster uh, decline and a faster demise, usually within three years, three to five years. This is the most aggressive form of the disease. So, what are the frontotemporal dementias? Well, as I mentioned, they're a family of dementias. Um, and by dementias, we mean the, a progressive neurodegenerative disease. Um, initial changes in FTD are very different from the initial changes of Alzheimer's disease. The, what changes first is personality. Not memory, not calculation, personality. So we, and that's something that's very entrenched in, in who we are, our personality. So it's unusual, even in an advanced dementia that's not FTD, for personality to change. Other aspects that might change include language, and occasionally we can have movement abnormalities that either of the form that we see in ALS and Lou Gehrig's disease or of the kind that we see in Parkinson's disease or, or diseases like it. Typically the disease involves at least one or two of these, of these uh, domains, if you will, personality and language and movement. What's very different about this disease is that it occurs in the prime of life when, when patients are, uh, are in a, usually in a, hap in a happy marriage with children and have a job. And so when these things start occurring, um, life tends to fall apart around them. When we try to describe uh, frontotemporal dementia, we, we do it in a, couple, in a, a few different ways. Uh, we can do it clinically, uh, which is what I do every day. I see patients and I talk about, try to understand what it is that's changed in their life day to day. Uh, so what are the symptoms um, and uh, how would we describe how they behave? Another way of thinking about it is anatomically. Which parts of the brain are involved? Um, frontotemporal dementia is nice in a way because it tells us what part of the brain is involved. The frontal and the temporal lobes of the brain are involved. And finally, we can think about the disease pathologically. What is going on at the cellular level? Um, we know that there are abnormal proteins that accumulate within the cells, and that's ultimately what's causing the dysfunction of the cells and the change in the behavior. And there are different kinds of accumulations, different kind of abnormal proteins that accumulate. And I'll have a few things to say about that in a few minutes. So these abnormal proteins that accumulate, they, they start somewhere. They, they start accumulating in one part of the brain. And then as time goes on, they progress. They progress to involve larger and larger areas of the brain. And if you think about that, it's a bit like an infection. Um, the, the, there's a point where it starts and then it expands to in, in include other areas of the brain. And if you think about the brain as a place where lots of things are happening, the symptoms that the patient will experience will depend on where it starts and which parts get involved with time. So it's not a, it's a moving target. The, the symptoms will, 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 will change as the disease progresses. And that's true of all of the neurodegenerative diseases that we, that we know. Um, it's just that the protein that's involved, the protein that accumulates abnormally, is a different protein in the different diseases. In Alzheimer's disease, the, the problem starts in the memory centers. And so the main initial problems of Alzheimer's disease is memory. Um, and as the disease progresses and other parts of the, of the brain get involved, um, the, there are more and more symptoms that appear. 
This is the brain of a normal individual who passed away from a motor vehicle accident. Um, another thing that I'm doing that I don't often do uh, during uh, uh, talks to uh, caregivers is I'm going to show lots of pictures of brains. Um, I hope that that sits well with you. If it doesn't, please let me know, and the next time there won't be any. Um, but this is a picture of a normal brain. Uh, it's about three pounds. Uh, in fact, there was a TV show a couple of years ago called Three Pounds, and it was about a neurosurgeon and, and the brain. Um, uh, and as you can see, it's nice and smooth. There's no gaps anywhere. It's nice and full and plump, um, a bit like fingers that are nice and stuck together like that. Um, what happens, though, with any neurodegenerative disease is that ultimately um, the, the, the tissues uh, atrophy, the tissues die, and the, and the brain becomes thinner, and um, the word we use is atrophy. This is an example of a patient who suffered from Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see, there's much less tissue. The brain is very, very shrunken. In Alzheimer's disease, particularly advanced Alzheimer's disease, the parts of the, the, most of the brain gets involved at, by the end of the disease. <coughs> This is in contrast uh, to frontotemporal dementia, where only the frontal and temporal parts of the brain get involved. And you, this is quite striking. You can see on the, um, of the picture here on the, can you see the cursor when I do that? Yeah? Good. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the frontal lobe is completely devastated. There's complete loss of the tissues in this area of the brain. And the temporal lobe in this particular patient, a bit less so, but clearly involved compared to, say, the back areas of the brain. And this is important because, as I mentioned, which parts of the brain are involved will determine what symptoms the patient has. This is an example. This is a, a, a picture showing uh, the various parts of the brain. Left is left and right is right and top is the front and bottom is the back of the brain. And as you can see, the right side, the frontal right side of the brain is the part responsible for social skills. The left side the frontal part of the left side of the brain is the part involved in speech and verbal output. In the temporal lobes, which you can't see on this slide because we're seeing the brain from the top, is another place where we control language understanding. Um, and on the right side, we'll have understanding of nonverbal language, what we call prosody. You know, the difference between, I had a great time last night, versus I had a great time last night. Same words, different meaning. Um, that part of the brain controls our understanding of those kinds of things. So as I mentioned, depending on which part of the brain gets involved, we get a different type of presentation. If the, um, the, 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 left, the right frontal and temporal areas are involved, we get the behavioral variant, the variant that's associated with social, uh, bad, bad social behavior. If the <coughs> left part of the brain is involved, we tend to get the language variants. So let me talk a little bit more about the behavioral variant. Um, as you saw, uh, socially inappropriate behavior. Sometimes there's the development of apathy, the tendency to not really be interested in doing anything. This is different from depression. This is just unmotivated, unenergetic, no, no interest. Um, there's a lack of interest in what other people might be feeling, uh, so-called empathy. Uh, not really understanding that somebody might be suffering, not being able to mobilize one's own emotion to help somebody who's suffering. For instance, if, um, if, if a patient with frontotemporal dementia was walking with somebody who, uh, with their caregiver who didn't have problems and the caregiver fell and, and broke her foot, they'd be like, oh, come on, get up, let's go, we're in a hurry. That kind of response. Mm -hmm. I did that to my wife once. <laughs> so we, were, we were jogging and I was really, really... <laughs> Um, the patients often have repetitive compulsive behaviors, um, which you saw a little bit in the, 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 uh, the, the small video of the gentleman cal doing the calculations. You saw him moving his arms like this while he was doing the calculations. So that kind of agitation, this stereotypic movements are, 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 are um, very frequently seen in this disorder. One change that we see that's very unusual in any other kind of uh, dementia is uh, changes in food preferences. A frontotemporal dementia is the only dementia that's associated with weight gain. All other dementias are associated with weight loss. The kinds of food changes that we see are the kind that lead to, to weight gain. So uh, an interest in 
uh, in, in sweet foods, an interest in cupcakes and chips and french fries, and a tendency to not be able to realize when we've eaten enough. Uh, so a patient with frontotemporal dementia might eat everything that's on their plate and then look around to see if anybody else has finished or hasn't quite finished their plate and say, can I finish that for you? Um, we talked a little bit about the language changes. The memory does tend to be okay in these patients. And finally, they have um, a, a striking loss of appreciation of the impact that their changes are having on their life and on the lives of others. Um, this is a phenomenon called, is a big word, but anazodiaphoria. It's the sense that there's something wrong with me, but it doesn't matter. So if you ask somebody with frontotemporal dementia, why are you here, why are we seeing you, they'll tell you, uh, you know, I have frontotemporal dementia or I have a brain problem. But what's the impact of that on you or on others? Oh, well, we're fine, there's no, no problem. The language variants are, um, are different in that the first thing that we note is trouble speaking. Um, there are different kinds, different ways in which this can, can occur. Uh, the lack, uh, we use the word primary progressive aphasia to describe these variants. Aphasia is trouble speaking or trouble understanding and progressive meaning that it's something that starts mild in a, at a mild point and then gets worse with time and primary because initially it's the only thing that's going wrong. So primary progressive aphasia can look and feel a little different in different patients. Sometimes it can look as if the person just doesn't understand what you're talking about, doesn't understand words. Mm -hmm. So you say, get, can you get some fo a fork and a spoon for me? And they'll look at you, what do you mean fork? What's a fork? Or you, you string a sentence together for them to do something and they just, they, you, you have to break it down into much simpler terms in, for, in order for them to understand. Another way it can present is with reduced output. So just nothing to say. There's uh, a lot of difficulty just putting thoughts together to, to, to express any ideas at all. And finally, uh, there could be difficulties. There, there's a desire to say things, but the, our ability to, sent, to put the sentence together in a grammatically correct way is absent. Um, and uh, that's very obvious when you listen to somebody uh, speaking like that. And I'll show you somebody like that in a few minutes. Typically, um, it doesn't matter whether it began with the behavioral uh, frontotemporal dementia or the language variant. As the disease progresses and involves other parts of the brain, um, th other symptoms will appear. So if you start with a behavioral variant, you will evolve into uh, some language problems as well and vice versa. So this is uh, some pictures of some brains. Uh, in green is uh, the parts of the brain that were involved on the first visit of these patients. And as you can see, the green parts of the brain here involve either the left frontal or left temporal areas of the brain, the, the parts that are involved in language. And then the second time the patients are seen, the blue areas of the brain have gotten involved. And, and as you can see, those areas start influencing other parts of behavior, including uh, the, the frontal um, the, the, these areas here which would influence um, motivation, for instance. This is a, a very famous patient. Her name is Ann Adams. We know her name because uh, her story has been published in Brain. Um, she was a, a botanist um, and uh, was very eloquent. Uh, she uh, developed uh, frontotemporal dementia that began as a primary progressive aphasia and ultimately she was diagnosed with cortical basal degeneration, which is an, one of the forms that's associated with movement disorders. Um, listen to her describing, she's trying to describe the scene that's on the upper right hand corner. I would like you to take a look at this picture and take your time and please tell me what you see. And if you can, please try to speak in sentences, okay? Take your time. I know this is a little bit difficult. Tree. Um, people. You can sense the frustration that she has. Did you, no sentences whatsoever. She's only using nouns and she's pointing. Mm -hmm. 
She's right-handed. Female. She's not using her right hand at all. Kite. Flag. Anyway, you get the point. Um, it turns out this um, patient is also famous for another reason, in that she, um, as, as her disease progressed, uh, even before she was diagnosed, though, um, she developed a new interest in, in painting, in drawing. Uh, and she started applying her, her, uh, her skills. And some of the paintings that you can see here from 1998 through to 2004, note the diagnosis was only made in 2002. Um, uh, some of the paintings are exquisite. They show uh, an incredible sense of colors, of detail, um, and actually, some might say, of um, compulsiveness um, with the detail that she, she puts in her pictures. And she, she suffered from um, a problem with uh, her inner ear, and she'd had a number of scans before she was sick from this disorder. And so there are scans dating back to before she was diagnosed. And as you can see here, the area, that, the area where the disease is setting in is here. In the, uh, on MRI scans, the sides are flipped. So right is left and left is right. So this is the left side of her brain here. And as you can see, as time, go, as time passes in here, we're looking at a six-year evolution. Um, as you can see, the area where language is set uh, is becoming more and more atrophic up to this point here. Um, I asked for permission of one of my own patients uh, who, uh, who has also developed a tendency to, to um, uh, artistic, new artistic tendencies. And this is one of his uh, watercolors. Very striking, very beautiful. Yeah. So let's talk about the movement a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a lot of overlap between certain types of movement disorders and frontotemporal dementia. The two main movement disorders are Parkinsonism, diseases that look like Parkinson's disease, and ALS, motor neuron disease. Um, ALS is probably the worst neurologic diagnosis that you can give anyone. It's when the motor neurons, the, mo the neurons that control the muscles, when they start dying, the muscles stop working. People can't swallow, they can't move, they can't breathe. And usually the disease um, will take its toll within uh, three years or so. Um, the other types of movement disorder uh, that we see in, in uh, frontotemporal dementia are, these are complicated names, but cortical basal degeneration and progressive supranuclear policy. For all intents and purposes, if, if you just take a very quick look, it looks like Parkinson's disease. People are stiff, they might shake a little bit, they'll walk a little funny. Um, so there's overlap between these disorders. And Adams, who you just saw, suffered from cortical basal degeneration. She lost the ability to, to use her right hand, which is why she was using her left hand to point. Um, the interesting thing about this disorder is it doesn't matter which disorder you have, what, what kind of presentation you have. It, for instance, if you had a gene that causes a disorder, many people in the family will have the disease, but the disease will present very differently from, for each individual. So you can have somebody that presents with the, their language variant, somebody that presents with the movement variant, and then someone else who presents with the behavioral variant. All in the same family, all caused by the same gene. So what causes it? Well, um, there's no one cause that we know per se. Uh, we, we don't believe that there's any environmental cause. That's in contrast to, say, Parkinson's disease, where we believe that there's, there are clear environmental causes. Unlike Alzheimer's disease, there are several different causes, several different things that can go wrong, different proteins that accumulate in the brain of, of an individual with the disorder. We talk about the protein tau, or the protein TDP43. Uh, these are the abnormal proteins that accumulate. So you can have, if you have a gene that causes the disorder, then you only have one protein that's wrong. But if you, if you have two different individuals with what looks like just standard behavioral variant FTD, one of them might have tau, the other one might have TDP43. There's no easy way of knowing that yet. But they will have only one problem. One protein will be abnormal. And that's also uh, different than al in Alzheimer's disease, where there are a number of things that can go wrong, including A beta and tau, which you may have heard of. In frontotemporal dementia, there's a very strong genetic link. Probably 40 to 50% of family of patients who have the disease uh, come from a family who has the disease. 
Uh, as I mentioned, the disease tends to be very different from individual to individual, so that's not always obvious unless you ask very specific questions. The behavioral problems, movement problems, muscle problems. Uh, and then when you start doing that, when you start getting a more complete history, it becomes more obvious that, the, uh, that there is a familial disorder. We can explain about 30 to 40 percent with known genes. There are three genes that explain probably 30 to 4 percent of all cases out there. And this is just so you can see the names of the proteins, but uh, TDP43 and tau make up about 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent of all cases of frontotemporal dementia. And then there's a couple of other uh, unusual proteins that make up the rest. How do we diagnose the disease? Um, well, typically uh, the diagnosis begins when somebody notices that behavior is changed. Or um, so the family, usually the first ones to notice. Sometimes it's the boss. The changes can be initially very subtle. Um, and, okay, and I've frequently seen this where, where there's often a blame. Like the, he's acting this way because of what I did five years ago or what we did when we were youngsters. Um, but it's not. It's not intentional. It's the brain is changing and they're suffering. A um, person may lose their job. Um, misdiagnosis is often very frequent. Uh, typically, uh, psychiatric diagnoses are given first. Um, and those diagnoses include atypical depression and bipolar disorder. When language is the first presentation, typically the patient himself is, or herself is very aware of the deficit and will, will seek medical attention themselves. So the first step, um, in my mind, of course I'm a neurologist so I'll say this, uh, but is referral to a neurologist. Somebody who, who any neurologist should be able to, to, to detect this or to get a sense that there's something going on. And then I would say, for these cases, referral to a, a neurologist with an interest in these disorders. And that's what this center is about, is about um, diagnosing and treating patients with these disorders. So what does the neurologist do? Well, he, he or she takes a history. Um, ask the patient some questions. It's often very important to separate the patient and the family, and this is something that we do as, as often as we can here. It's not always possible, but we try to get a, 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 the opportunity to speak to caregivers independently um, to get a sense of, of what they're experiencing. Um, we do initial cognitive testing. Um, it's usually very simple. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes to do that testing. And we'll do a, a neurological examination. So if there's motor neuron disease or if there's Parkinsonism, we'll pick that up right away. We almost always order additional tests, uh, MRI, lumbar puncture, uh, PET scans. There's two kinds of PET scans that can be done. Additional neuropsychological testing. We always order a little bit of blood work. And um, we're not doing it yet here, but we'll be hopefully doing it before the end of the year. Um, we, we want to be able to offer genetic testing in those cases where we think the disease is familial. This is a, um, and, and I said that this talk came from both Dr. Banks and myself. This, this is Dr. Banks' slide and she chose to put my picture there, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, this is a picture of uh, a clock that was drawn by one of my patients that I, uh, that I had in Montreal. Uh, so it's in French. I asked her to draw a clock. So if she didn't understand what I meant. She said, what do you mean clock? What's that clock? Um, and so I said, a clock, draw a clock. So she simply wrote clock. Horloge is clock in French. I said, okay. Well, I drew the circle for her. I said, imagine this is, this, this is the, the face of a clock. Now put in the numbers. So she did. She put in the numbers until she ran out of space. Very concrete. Doesn't know what a clock is. Has no understanding or concept of what a clock is. Oh, and this is her MRI. And as you can see, the, the areas of the brain that are most affected are the temporal and the frontal lobes. Um, so these other tests that we do, the, um, the, the other diagnostic tests, the, the steps, the MRI, very important, um, uh, although in the very, very early stages it might be, might be normal. The pattern that we see though in, in the, when the disease is more advanced shows atrophy of the frontal and the temporal lobes. And this is very different than Alzheimer's disease where atrophy involves the memory centers and the back part of the brain rather than the front part. The changes on the FDG PET scan, this is a scan that looks at the brain's ability to use sugar, 
um, shows the same pattern as the MRI scan, but it shows it much earlier, probably two or three years before any changes appear on the, MR on the MRI, the changes will be present on the PET scan. We sometimes use Amavid. This is a scan that's not paid for yet by Medicare or by insurance carriers. This is a scan for amyloid. Amyloid is the, is the protein that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. So if we do this test and the scan is negative, then it's not Alzheimer's disease and therefore more likely to be FTD. We do the lumbar puncture for similar reasons. And then as I mentioned, um, we, we may do genetic testing. Um, I, you've seen some MRIs of, uh, of patients with FTD, so here are some more. Uh, but look at the PET scan on the right, uh, and as you can see, uh, there's devastation. Everything should be red. The whole brain should be red like this. And as you can see, the, front, the frontal areas and the temporal areas are devastated. So um, the second step, uh, in addition to the, lo the, lo the labs, the MRIs and the PET scans and the lumbar punctures, uh, often involves neuropsychological testing. And like the MRI, neuropsychological testing looks for patterns, patterns that fit which parts of the brain are supposed to be involved and help us make the diagnosis. This is a picture of Dr. Banks, for those of you who are wondering. Um, also, the neuropsychological testing is helpful because we can often we can often uh, isolate strengths and weaknesses, and we can help the, help the family and help the caregivers understand that this is a weakness. You know, if, if you try, if you depend on this, it's gonna fail. You need to work on this. You need to depend on these strengths that, that the patient has. And um, in terms of the, the, the weaknesses, you try to work around them and try to find ways to compensate for those weaknesses. One of the things that we sometimes do in neuropsychology is to look at other aspects of, of um, personality and social behavior. And uh, one of the tests that we do uh, infrequently um, involves trying to understand people's emotions. So as you look at this picture here, all of you are probably appreci appreciating that she's demonstrating maybe some sadness, maybe some happiness, maybe, um, maybe some disgust, and maybe some anger. All of you realize that this is the same person and that she's acting and she's probably not a very good actress to begin with. <laughs> but somebody with frontotemporal dementia will not be able to do that, will not be able to, to interpret the feeling that the person is, is, is having. Uh, and that's obvious from, this is, there's been some research showing this, that sadness, anger and fear are not recognized as well by patients with frontotemporal dementia. So if they're not responding to uh, the fear that you're experiencing or the anger that you're experiencing, um, it's not because they're not interested, it's because they don't get it. Um, so once we accumulate all of this information, um, we see you again, uh, we see the patient again, and we, uh, we might need to order more tests because the tests don't always help us make the diagnosis right away. Frequently we re recommend some form of treatment uh, to try and help with the symptoms. If we think Alzheimer's disease is involved, we'll probably try medications that are used to treat Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, we may refer to, for other interventions, and there are lots of other interventions that are, that are helpful. Uh, and by that I mean physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, speech therapy, social work, counseling. Um, the medication, in terms of treating with medications, uh, we're limited. Uh, there's no cure for the disease, just like Alzheimer's disease. We can't stop the accumulation of the abnormal proteins. Um, but we have noticed that certain types of antidepressants, not all of the antidepressants, but certain, certain types are actually helpful in reducing some of the, the difficult behaviors. Um, the one that has the best track record right now is trazodone. Uh, it's used in many other contexts to help with sleep, but for, for FTD, it's very helpful in calming uh, the patient and helping them um, cope a little bit better with day-to-day -day things. Alzheimer's drugs are actually pretty much contraindicated in frontotemporal dementia. For a while, we thought maybe they'd be helpful. Nemendo or memantine has recently been proven. Last year, it was proven that it's not helpful. It actually makes the condition worse. And the cholinesterase inhibitors, the medications that we use to treat, we first use to treat Alzheimer's disease, Aricept, Exelon, Patch, and so on, those medications can sometimes make the behavioral problems worse as well. So we try to stay away from them unless, unless there's a suspicion that we're dealing with Alzheimer's disease. 
So how do we treat it? Well, as I mentioned, currently we can only treat symptomatically. Um, we have, uh, there are upcoming trials. I mentioned that the two main proteins that accumulate in the brains of patients with frontotemporal dementia are tau and TDP43. Um, so they're actually being, currently there are, there are drugs that act against tau, that help tau, that prevent tau from accumulating or, or help the accumulations of tau get disrupted and, and picked up by the immune system. And there will be clinical trials in, in these. There are currently, there have been very small clinical trials, but there will be multi-center clinical trials in which we're hoping to participate. I mentioned as well that certain genetic diseases can cause the frontotemporal dementia. There's progranulin, tau mutations, and another one on chromosome 9. It's called chromosome 9 open reading frame 72, or CRORF72. Um, these, these gene defects cause a specific uh, protein abnormality. Uh, progranulin and, and uh, chromosome 9 mutation, they cause TDP43 and uh, the tau mutation obviously causes a tau uh, accumulation. So if we can make the diagnosis early in, say, the children of people who have suffered from a genetic disorder, then we can start the treatment early. And that's where the science is going, treating the disease before it actually appears. As I mentioned, uh, social work uh, is very, very uh, critical in helping us uh, and you uh, with uh, patients that suffer from this disorder. Uh, education and support are, uh, are, are helpful. I mean, it's not a cure, um, but uh, I think when you know what you're dealing with and you have a little bit of guidance, our hope is that uh, we can make life better. Uh, we're very lucky here uh, at the Lou Ruvo Center. Uh, Lisa Radin, who is um, uh, who was the leader of a support group that's been in Vegas for a, a couple of years, um, was the caregiver of somebody who suffered from frontotemporal dementia. She's written a book called What If It's Not Alzheimer's Disease? And uh, she will be running her support group here at our center from now on, I hope. Did I see Lisa here? Oh. <laughs> uh, so we're very happy to have you, Lisa. Um, speech and language pathologists, speech and language therapists are very helpful, particularly if we're dealing with um, the variant that's associated with motor neuron disease uh, that can lead to swallowing difficulties, but also in people who are having language difficulties per se in helping them communicate and helping them understand. Occupational therapy um, helps us adapt um, to the, the changing abilities and needs, particularly for those who have movement disorders, uh, and physical therapy the same. Um, so what does the future look like? Um, well, actually, compared to Alzheimer's disease, I think the future looks a little bit brighter um, because we, we know uh, that there's only one abnormality in any one patient. So the, our, our, our task at, the task at hand for us is to find those patients that have, to, to determine what abnormality I exists in, in each patient. And once we've done that, um, we, we have our goal, it's, it's set, uh, we have to figure out how to prevent that protein from accumulating. Um, so uh, so we're, we're going to be treating this, the etiology, the cause of this disorder uh, very soon. Um, but we also try to help with some of the behaviors. I mentioned the use of SSRIs. Uh, we have a clinical trial that's starting up soon where we're gonna use another medication called Nudexta, uh, which helps in some of the disinhibition, some of the behavior abnormalities that we see in, in FTD. Um, so there is, uh, there is nonetheless, despite how difficult this disease is, uh, a sense of optimism that uh, there's uh, light at the end of this tunnel. Um, another reason why um, FTD patients, uh, why we should have optimism about FTD patients is that they're younger, and so they're not sick with a lot of other things, uh, and so they're, they're patients that can uh, participate in clinical trials um, much better than, than uh, patients with, that are older that have Alzheimer's disease. In some cases, the disease, as I mentioned, moves very quickly so that if we have a disorder, if we have a treatment that, if, that affects the evolution of the disease, uh, we're likely to pick it up much quicker. We're likely to be able to, to see that there's an effect much easier. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, as once we've established what kind of cell damage there is, there's only one 
type of cell damage in any one patient. And I'll say there's a few other breakthroughs. Um, you, you may have heard of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy uh, or punch drunk or um, dementia pugilistica. Uh, these are the, the dementia or the, the, the cognitive and behavioral difficulties that uh, professional athletes develop after having been knocked out many times. And we see this in uh, boxers and um, boxers and football players and hockey players. Well, these patients suffer from a tauopathy, from a disease where tau accumulates abnormally. And we think that uh, treatment for this disorder is very likely to be helpful for, for frontotemporal dementia as well. Um, at our clinic, uh, which has been established now for about two and a half years, um, we're, we focus on, on this particular group. Um, uh, we, we specialize in the diagnosis and treatment. We do have uh, investigation, we have a few investigator uh, driven research, uh, but we're also going to be involved, as I mentioned, in actual multi center clinical trials in the very near future. And as I also mentioned, education is a, a key part of what we can offer. Um, some of the resources, I think many of you have seen the center's library. Um, the the uh, Association for Frontotemporal Dementia website is uh, extremely helpful. Lots of information about uh, the clinical trials and about the disease itself. The Alzheimer's Associ Association website also has uh, extensive uh, literature on um, the disorder as well. The UCSF group, uh, University of San Francisco, University of California in San Francisco, um, the, the group that's probably most advanced in, in um, studying and treating this disease also has a very good website. Uh, this is a copy of uh, Lisa's book. Um, the third edition was published yesterday. I didn't realize that, but uh, yesterday. Uh, and it's available on Amazon. I, I probably shouldn't be doing this. It's a, a, a blatant pr promotion. Um, <laughs> But it's something I believe in, so I don't, ha I don't hesitate. In, in I recommend, I've recommended it to many patients, and I don't hesitate to recommend it to you now. Um, and uh, Lisa's support group. There are other books available. These are uh, free. Uh, you can download them from the AFTD website, uh, as well as from the NIH website um, on frontotemporal disorders, including how to deal with the children uh, of the disorder, the, who have patients who suffer from this disorder. Um, so I'll finish on that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cummings, uh, our director, for allowing us uh, uh, this luncheon, uh, who that I hope many of you will be uh, participating in very soon. I'd like to thank Mr. Erwin Kirshner, who has been supporting um, some of our efforts, particularly the genetic testing. I think I saw him step in a few minutes ago. Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Kirshner. Uh, to Suzanne uh, Solzano for uh, arranging uh, this, She's, uh, I, don't, I don't know how we would get anything done with, without her. Um, she's persistent and um, implacable. Uh, the event team in particular, uh, Jenna Sinclair, for, for helping um, organize the site. Um, for those of you that are going for the dinner, um, you can thank uh, Doc, uh, Chef Gustav's catering team yourselves and to uh, Gina Hines, who is in charge of our philanthropic effort. So on that note, I'll take questions. Yes. You know, I have a long answer to that question in that it was discovered and described before Alzheimer's disease was. Um, yeah, it's, uh, the disorder is often called Pick's disease, uh, and Pick wrote about it in a series of papers at the turn of the 19th century. Alzheimer's didn't produce his papers until, uh, I think, uh, 1906 or 07. Uh, so it, it was, it, it's, it's been known, we've known about it for a long time. It's just been under the radar. Um, but great efforts in understanding the disease and, and finding treatment for it have occurred in the last 15 years or so. Yeah. So we treat it more as a psychiatric, so you had mentioned psychiatric. Yeah, I think a lot of patients have been going misdiagnosed and have ended up on psych wards. I think many have probably ended up in jails. Um, but I think a lot of them were probably just said that they had Alzheimer's disease. 
you know, just a strange form of it. Senility, yeah, <laughs> which means, which just means old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, question as far as upcoming research on those of us who are children of people with this disease. Mm -hmm. My mother died of ALS, and my father has uh, FTD. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm by, by history a research engineer, <laughs> and so my. How does a person go about volunteering to get into research pro uh, programs on stuff like that? Um, well, there are, I would say the first place to go would be, well, you can speak to us. Okay. Um, we, our, our research program is nascent. We're just starting out and, and the, in particular the, um, the genetic program, uh, we hope that, that we'll hope it'll be running by the end of the year. Um, but the AFTD website also has a lot of um, links to different places where there is active research going on. I, I hate to send people to a different place than here, um, but the UCSF website is probably a good place to look as well. The UCSF, and I think it's written there on the, one of the last pages. Um, there's another website by, that's run by uh, the NIH called uh, clinicaltrials.gov and they, it, it's a little bit uh, overbearing but you, if you, um, you can search for trials in FTD and they will, uh, I, there's a, a way for, there's a way to, to describe your search and to, to specify that you want active trials in FTD and so somebody with a little bit of computer knowledge can do that. Yes. Um, one of the women here wanted to know then, um, is the frontal temporal dementia and, and ALS, is it all from the same um, proteins? Yes. Are they caused by the same? Yes, that's a very good question. And absolutely, typically um, when frontal temporal dementia is, uh, if you have a disorder, say, well, ALS is, just as complicated as frontotemporal dementia in that there are probably are lots of causes of ALS. Um, but the main, the main and the most frequent cause of ALS is accumulation of, abnormal, of the abnormal protein TDP43. So if, you, if you're asking, the question to the question is, you know, those patients who suffer from ALS and those patients who suffer from FTD, what do they have in common? I would say it's that abnormal protein TDP43. Although there are cases of FTD that don't, and there are also cases of ALS that don't. But the main overlap is this abnormal protein. Does that answer the if question? If you were to identify that, yes, I don't think it did. If you were to identify that gene in young people now, um, at this point, there really is, is there a way to work with them if they have no symptoms? Um, well, uh, in the context, well, there's two, two questions there. One is the abnormal protein and one is the gene. Uh, there are genes, the, particularly chromosome 9 and the progranulin gene, that cause both ALS and FTD and, and the pathology of those patients is TDP43. So yes, we could identify all a bunch, we could all identify a very large group of people who have an abnormality of this gene and who will over time develop either ALS or FTD or both. Um, in terms of treating them before they develop the disease, that's where the science is at right now. Um, and by being at right now, I mean we're thinking about ways of, of uh, putting together clinical trials that will involve patients before they develop symptoms. Uh, but, we're, but that's not occurring yet. I think that within the next few years, there will be what we call pre-symptomatic trials, trials before any symptoms appear. Of note, we're doing that in Alzheimer's disease right now. We started, it's been about two or three years now, we're treating patients uh, who will develop Alzheimer's disease, but haven't yet. So in terms of, of Alzheimer's disease, a couple of years ahead of FTD. Uh, but Alzheimer's disease is more complicated. <laughs>